Thank you for joining us online today as we worship the resurrection of Jesus Christ, the most pivotal event in all of human history. So join in, gather the family, and let's worship our risen Savior. He is risen. All right. Uh, hey, welcome. So glad you've chosen to join us uh, this Easter. Um, this past week, I learned of a new medical condition that I, had, I didn't even know was a thing or existed. Uh, it's known as nocturnal lagothalmus. I don't know how many of you have heard of it. Um, it means literally to be able to sleep with your eyes open. Do you know some people do this? Either partially, like kind of like this, or really wide open. Um, and it's actually more common than you realize. Uh, I kind of... <clears throat> Think in terms of that might be a little alarming if your spouse had this condition, right? You might look like you turn to them and all of a sudden, whoa, are you awake? Are you asleep? Some of you go, well, that's nothing new, Pastor Rick. I know a lot of us that kind of have our eyes open, but not a lot going on, right? Not, not fully seeing or realizing. And I think that in many ways kind of describes the first disciples, the first Easter. Uh, matter of fact, they were physically seeing Jesus, yet not really fully seeing Jesus. And I think that describes a lot of folks as, it, as they come into Easter. You know, they come in, they have, okay, we're going to have Easter egg hunts, we're going to have a meal, we're going to dress up, and, and they're going, oh yeah, we're going to celebrate this thing called the resurrection of Jesus without really comprehending or really taking in the weight of the resurrection that the tomb is empty and the implications of that. So today, I want you to think with me. I want, us to, I want us to consider not only the reality of the resurrection, but it's my prayer, the implications of that in your life um, and in my life today. Uh, matter of fact, we're going to look at Luke chapter 24. Luke records three uh, accounts on the very first Easter, three resurrection accounts. We're going to walk through them together this morning. But it's interesting, the middle one, which we'll probably spend the most time on, describes these two disciples of Jesus who are on the road to, to Emmaus that first Easter day, and Jesus physically walks alongside of them, and obviously they see him, they're conversing, that they don't realize it's Jesus. And notice uh, what Luke 24, 15 says. It says, as they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked with them but they were kept from recognizing him, okay? Matter of fact, it's, we're going to see it's a little while later, that same uh, early evening, Jesus had a meal with them, and he broke bread. And when he was praying a prayer of thanksgiving, their eyes were open. Notice what the text says in verse 30 and 31. It says, and when he was at, when he was at the table with them, he took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and began to give it to them. Then their eyes were opened and they recognized him and he disappeared from their sight. Rollo May, who is a well-known psychologist, kind of previous generation, well-known author, uh, was not a religious man. Matter of fact, uh, he acknowledges that. Well, one Easter season, he found himself in Athens, Greece, of all places, and being a psychologist and interesting and various local phenomena. He thought, you know, I, I think I'll go and see what the locals were doing. And so he went to a Greek Orthodox service. And as he's there in the church service, just like we've experienced this morning, at the end of the service, the priest stood up and said, he is risen. And Rollo May said that the entire congregation, and surprisingly himself included, responded by saying, he is risen indeed, Okay. And he said, when he said those words, here's what he writes. I found this fascinating. He said, and suddenly, along with everyone else, I was seized with a moment of spiritual reality. What would it mean if he was indeed risen? If death was not the end, well, that would change everything. Today, I'm here to remind us of the implications, the life-changing implications that he has risen. Uh, today we're going to look at three accounts from the Gospel of Luke. So if you have your Bibles or however you access Scripture, turn to Luke chapter 24. We're going to look at uh, the three appearances that are recorded there on that first day, 
the women at the tomb first, the two disciples on the road to Emmaus next, and we'll wrap it up with the disciples uh, behind closed doors, okay? So let's begin with the first one, the women at the tomb. Uh, Notice what Scripture says, beginning in verse 1 of chapter 24. It says, On that first day of the week, very early in the morning, the women took the spices that they had prepared and went to the tomb. They found the stone rolled away from the tomb, but when they entered, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. Okay, Notice they're going expecting Jesus to be in the tomb. They're going for the purpose of basically preparing his body properly for burial. Verse 4, while they were still wondering about this, suddenly two men in clothes that gleamed like lightning stood beside them. Now, when you read that, you go, okay, that's, 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 that's something very unusual. Other gospel writers let us know we're talking about angels, but just, just so you know. Verse 5, it says, In their fright, the women bowed down with their faces to the ground, but the men or the angels said to them, Why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here. He is risen. Remember how he told you while he was still with you in Galilee that the Son of Man must be delivered over to the hands of sinners, be crucified, and on the third day be raised again. Then they remembered his words. Notice what it says next. When they came back from the tomb, uh, he t- they told all these things to the 11 and to the others. So the women are reporting back to the men who are the disciples, okay? Verse 10, it says, and it was, and he mentions names, Mary Magdalene first, Joanna, Mary the mother of James, and the others uh, who were with him and what they told this to the apostles. And then verse 11, notice their response. It says, but they did not believe the women because their words seemed to them like nonsense. Now, let me point out a couple of things. Jesus first appeared to the women following his resurrection, okay? Now, here's why that's significant. Significant for a couple of reasons. One thing to consider in the first century, and please don't be offended by this, gals, but in the first century, you were not allowed to testify in court because your word in that society was not considered reliable. So, The early disciples or followers of Jesus, if they were concocting or writing an account to convince you of the truth of the resurrection, they would not have said the women saw him first. So why is it recorded that way? Because that's how it happened. But it also says something I think very significant for each of us. And that is that Jesus oftentimes does the very unexpected thing, doesn't he? Remember who were the very first people who received the announcement that the Messiah had come, that Jesus had come? They were a group of outcasts called shepherds in the field, shepherds who were not allowed to worship because they were considered ceremonially unclean. So why did he begin with women? He began with women because women in that culture were not esteemed as valued as men. And what Jesus was affirming and what Jesus is saying is that each of us matter to God and there is level ground at the foot of the cross. Now, here's what's also interesting. The very first woman that is mentioned is a woman by the name of Mary Magdalene. Let me tell you a little bit about Mary Magdalene. Mary Magdalene was a prostitute. She was a prostitute whose life had been controlled by evil. She was a woman with a broken past. She was a woman that in that culture would have been looked down on and considered a lost cause. So who did Jesus choose to be the very first person that he would appear to? John 20 tells us the the events. It was, in fact, Mary Magdalene. What do we learn from that? We learn this important thing. That regardless of your past, regardless of how you may view yourself, God views you in his eyes as those for whom Christ came. And the offer of life and forgiveness is extended. His grace is extended for you. Regardless of what you've done, regardless of who you are, you matter to him. Matter of fact, that reminds us that the gospel of Jesus Christ declares that we are set right on the basis of grace, not what we deserve, not based on our morality, but based on what Jesus has done for us. Romans chapter 3, look at it with me again. Verse 23, it says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. You may say, well, that's obvious for a Mary Magdalene. Well, it's obvious for each of us. 
and are all justified freely by his grace. Grace meaning that we don't earn or deserve, that is freely given through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. In other words, the payment for our sin was accomplished by Jesus Christ. So what does that say? It says your past does not keep you from a relationship with God or a future with him. Second group that we see, uh, or second appearance, are the two disciples on the road to Emmaus. Um, These disciples are not named. And when you see the word disciple, don't think the apostles, just think a follower of Jesus. We read their story um, uh, beginning uh, together in verse, I believe it's uh, 13, excuse me. It says, now that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. They were talking with each other about everything that had happened. And as they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked along with them. So here they are. They're talking about what had just happened, his arrest, his burial, his crucifixion, and the claims that he had risen. Verse 16, but they were kept from recognizing him. And he asked them, what are you discussing together as you walk along the road? They stood still, their faces downcast. Notice one of them named Cleopas uh, asked him, are you the only one visiting Jerusalem who doesn't know the things that have happened here in these days? In other words, haven't you heard? What things, he asked. So here's Jesus. Jesus walks along. Hey, what are you talking about? He's like, the things that are happening about Jesus, about his crucifixion, about people who are even now saying that he rose. He's like, oh, okay, what things, Jesus asked, as if, you know. He was uninformed about Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. Notice he was a prophet, powerful in word and deed before God and all the people. The chief priests and the rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death, and they crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. We had hoped. Notice what they say next. And what is more, it's the third day since all this took place. In addition, some of our women amazed us. They went to the tomb early this morning, but they did not find his body. It goes on to say, they came and told us uh, that they had seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. We just read that. And then some of the companions went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but they did not see Jesus. And then notice how it uh, will end this section. He said to them, how foolish you are and how slow to believe all the prophets have spoken. Did not the Messiah have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? And then look at verse 27. And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. There's a whole lot in this conversation that I want to just highlight briefly this morning, okay? I I love the picture of it, of Jesus walking along. They're talking about Jesus. Who are you talking about? Jesus. And, And they're not recognizing that it's Jesus who's with them, right? Um, but the first thing uh, that's pretty obvious is they didn't recognize it was Jesus. Uh, look at verse uh, 16 with me. Notice what it says, but they were kept from recognizing him. Let me ask a personal question this morning. Who is Jesus to you? Do you recognize him to be the son of God, your Messiah, Do you recognize, do you believe, do you see him to be not just a great prophet, not just a great religious figure, but in fact, the son of God came to earth to reconcile you to God? Do you see him clearly? Notice they were kept from seeing him. They obviously had known Jesus. They believed in him. And that raised the question, what kept them from seeing Jesus? Well, the text doesn't tell us. Could have been many things. But one thing is true. Oftentimes we don't see what we're not looking for. Or if we're looking or thinking of something else, it oftentimes blinds us to what's really happening and what's immediately in front of us. You may be familiar with an experiment psychologists have used. uh, It's pretty popular. uh, Put together by a guy named Daniel Simmons. It's called the invisible gorilla. Have you all heard the invisible gorilla? Here's the way it works. The invisible gorilla is you have a group of people, in this case, uh, a group of students that are passing a basketball between each other. And those who are observing this scene are asked to do one thing, count the number of times the ball has passed. And so as you watch the scene, you begin looking at the ball. In the middle of that, here's what happens. A gorilla walks across in the middle of the event and then beats its chest and then walks off. Afterwards, the psychologists who put this together say, hey, did you, 
Did you see the gorilla? To which the majority of us would respond, what gorilla? There was no gorilla. And I think oftentimes when we come to something incredible like the resurrection of Jesus, there is within us that doubt or that question, did he really rise from the dead? Today I pray that your eyes will be open and that you will realize the implications that the tomb is empty. The first thing is, obviously, they were not expecting it. The second thing to take into account was the emotional state that they were in. And I think that is one of the, one of the reasons they didn't recognize Jesus is because they were in grief. And if you've walked through grief, you'll know it's like walking through a fog, is it not? And oftentimes, the weight of that is so heavy that you can't see what's immediately in front of you. And I think that was the case for them. Scripture tells us that they were downcast. Matter of fact, the the text says that they stopped and stood still, their faces downcast, verse 17. And notice what they say in verse 21. But we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. What is more, it is the third day since all this took place. Let me just remind you of something that should be pretty obvious. Although Jesus told people that he would rise on the third day, These early followers were not gathered together doing a countdown, okay? They were not anticipating that. They were not expecting that. In fact, it was quite the opposite. And what we see in this passage is that they were so overwhelmed at his death, they could not see the reality of his resurrection. And I think it makes perfect sense because what they were doing, many do today, and that was simply this. They were looking at life without a resurrection. And I want you to think with me for a moment the implications of that because that may be where you're at today. As you come into a worship where we celebrate Easter and the risen Christ, there in your life you may go on, well, I I don't, I, I just have trouble believing in that. So I want to push back a little bit and say, fine, if you do not believe in a resurrection, then at least have the honesty to look deeply into the implications of not believing in a resurrection, okay? Matter of fact, uh, let's walk through what a few of those might look like. If Christ has not been risen, I hope you enjoy your life because there's nothing more to come. This is it. This is as good as it gets. There's nothing more. If Christ has not been raised, then all your accomplishments will die with you. Let me remind you, 100, two years from now, no matter how significant or important or how big you may be, people will forget you, okay? Number three, the tragedies of this life will be unresolved and unredeemed. In other words, the tragedies, the the death, the cancer, the accidents, there is no end of the story if this is all there is. And finally, those you love, those you have loved and lost are lost forever. Now, when I say that on Easter, you're going, man, that's depressing, right? Absolutely. But that is the reality if you do not believe in the reality of the resurrection. Your only other option is there is no resurrection, okay? And if there is no resurrection, then you need to be honest and say, I believe those things to be true. So, I love what Paul writes in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 13. He's writing to believers who are going through difficult times, times of trial and tribulation and of grief. And in 1 Thessalonians 4.13, we read as follows. He says, brothers and sisters, we do not want you to be uninformed about those who sleep in death. In other words, those who have died, so that you do not grieve like the rest of mankind who have no hope. Let me tell you, I've been a pastor for a lot of years, more than 30 years, and I've done more funerals than I care to count. And I can tell you there is a marked difference between doing a funeral celebration of life for someone who lived with the assurance and the hope of the resurrection of Jesus and those who did not have that hope and did not profess that faith. I've done enough services to know that the context and the environment and the way people grieve with hope is radically different than those who grieve without hope. And what we see in the disciples at this point, these these early disciples, is that they had lost hope. They had lost hope. Fourth thing I would share with you, or third thing I would share with you from this passage, 
uh, with these, it's true of these guys, is, is notice how they were surprised in the conversation with Jesus that Jesus was unaware of the events that had just transpired. And, 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 I, and I hope I highlighted that as I read the passage. As they are walking with Jesus, not recognizing it's Jesus, and he's asking them, what are you talking about? We're talking about Jesus. Oh, it's almost like Jesus would be saying, oh, I've heard of him, right? Um, it reminds me of something that I get a kick out of doing every once in a while. I will sometimes call people who visit our church just to welcome them, right? And I'll say, hey, glad to have you worship with us. And the way I usually do that is I don't always say, hey, this is Pastor Chuck. I just say, hey, this is Chuck Martin. Glad to have you worship. I'm, you know, from Frisco first. You know, you have any questions? What was your experience like? And oftentimes they won't recognize that, you know, I'm the pastor of the church. And so I'll just ask them, so what was your experience like? And they'll go, oh, you know, it was good. And I say, well, what would you think of the service? And they'll start, they'll start telling me like a critique of my sermon or a service, you know. And then sometimes in the middle of that, they'll go, oh, wait a minute. Did you say Chuck Martin? Are you, pa- are you the pa-? I was like, yeah, I'm Pastor Chuck. And then they usually laugh and I'll go, gotcha, you know. Um, and you go, why do you enjoy doing that? I don't know. It's just something about my nature. <laughs> But I kind of have a feeling Jesus might have done the same thing. Oh, so what are you talking about? We're talking about, you know, the crucifix, and the people are claiming that he rose. Oh, interesting, right? Um, The reality is the resurrection of Jesus Christ was not done in a corner. This was not a private event. And the text tells us that they were, in fact, surprised that he pretended not to know what took place. They said, everyone in Jerusalem has been talking that. We all know about this. Let me remind you that when Jesus opened eyes that were blind, when he fed 5,000, when he talked to the multitude, there were thousands who followed him. He had a very public ministry. They knew these events, and the resurrection accounts are not just few, a handful, but Acts tells us over a period of 40 days, he appeared to many, as many as 500 at one time. So here's what I want you to see. You do not have to take a blind loop of faith when it comes to trusting in the resurrection of Jesus. The evidence is there, was not done in a corner. So much so that in Acts chapter 26, some 25 years later, Paul is speaking to King Agrippa, who was the Jewish uh, ruler over that area of Jerusalem. And notice what he says. He says, the king is familiar with these things and I can speak freely to him. I am convinced that none of this has escaped his notice because it was not done in a corner. Gary Habermas put together 39 extra biblical resources that validate the claims and the historicity of the person of Jesus. This is not mythology. This is rooted and grounded in truth. And finally, I'd share with you, Jesus opened the minds of these two followers. He opened their minds and their eyes so that they could see what he had accomplished through the cross. I want you to see how he did that. Look at verse 25 with me again for just a moment. And he said to them, how foolish you are and how slow to believe all the prophets have spoken. Might underline that all the prophets have spoken. Did not the Messiah have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? And then he continues, and beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. Man, I would have loved to have been a fly on the wall. What Jesus was saying to those who are familiar with the Old Testament scriptures, do you not see how they point to me? Do you not recognize that the Passover lamb points to an ultimate Passover lamb, that when John the Baptist said, behold, the lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world, it pointed to me. Do you not see when they put the blood on the door frame and the lintel of the house, it was a reminder that my blood would be shed on a cross. Do you not recognize that when they offered sacrifices and went on the day of atonement, the priest would come and offer a sacrifice, one sacrifice for the sins of the people, that there would one day be one sacrifice for all, my sacrifice. You see, here's what you see. As you study scripture, you see that it fits together, that the pieces are not random, that it's not accidental, that God had a plan, and that plan pointed to a person, and that person is Jesus, and he accomplished it for you and I. So I believe what he did is help them connect the dots. And what is my prayer is if you have never investigated this yourself, that you would connect the dots, you would weigh the evidence. He specifically mentions the prophecies, the prophets, 
and what they said about him. There is a gentleman by the name of Peter Stoner who was a mathematician. He wrote a book called Science Speaks. And what he did was he investigated the prophecies of, about Jesus and asked kind of a, a great question. And that is, what is the likelihood that anyone in history would fulfill even eight of the prophecies that Jesus fulfilled? Um, let's walk through briefly what he said, that he would be born of a virgin, for example. Isaiah 7, 14, they'd be born in Bethlehem. Micah 5, 2, um, that he'd be called a Nazarene, grow up there. Isaiah 11, 1, um, that he would make a triumphal entry into Jerusalem on the donkey. Zechariah 9, 9, um, that he'd be betrayed for 30 pieces of silver. Not 29, not 31, 30, right? Pretty specific, Psalm 41, Psalm 55. That he would be crucified between two thieves, Notice it continues that he, his garments would be parted and gambled for, Psalm 22. And then finally, that he would raise from the dead. Just eight of them, and there are many more than that. And he asked the question, what is the likelihood any one person in history would do all eight of these? Came up with a mathematical formula, and then he put it in terms that even a layman like myself would understand. And he said, take the state of Texas, all 268,601 square miles, cover it two feet in silver dollars, and ask someone to find the one silver dollar. That is the likelihood that any one person in history would fulfill the prophecies that Jesus Christ fulfilled. Now, why do I say that? I have, I have no idea how close to that Peter Stoner is, but I know enough to know that the evidence is there if your eyes are open. Matter of fact, I would challenge you, if you've never seriously considered the historicity of Christ and the claims of Christ, I have a couple of resources I would recommend. One's called The Case for Christ, it was written by Lee Strobel. Lee's wife became a follower of Jesus. He was an award-winning journalist for the Chicago Tribune. And he set out to disprove the claims of Christianity. Ended up becoming a Christian in the process. Another person who did basically the same thing was a guy named Josh McDowell. And he wrote a book called Evidence That Demands a Verdict. And I encourage you, if you've never investigated that, to do that. And finally, this morning, I'll mention the third and final one I want to address this morning, and that is when Jesus appeared to his disciples behind locked doors. And again, they were, they, were in, they were in an upper room. The doors were locked because they were afraid that since they had come for Jesus, they would be next. And Jesus suddenly appears from before them. Notice, notice, what, the, notice what the text says, uh, beginning in verse 36. It says, while they were still talking about this, that was the claims that the two disciples on the road to Emmaus had said and what the women had said. It says, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, peace be with you. Notice it says, Jesus himself stood among them. He didn't knock on the door. <laughs> he suddenly appeared. He materialized in front of them. And notice how it continues. I love this. They were startled and frightened, obviously, thinking that they saw a ghost. And he said to them, why are you troubled and why do doubts rise in your mind? Look at my hands and my feet. It is I myself. I love that. It's me, right? Notice he continues, touch me and touch me and see. A ghost does not have flesh and bones as you see I have. In other words, he's, he is demonstrating the material nature of his resurrection. He said, when he had said that, he showed them his hands and feet. And while they still not did, while they still, excuse me, did not believe it because of joy and amazement, he asked them, do you have anything here to eat? Now imagine, okay, here he is, touch, see. He's give me something to eat. Notice what happens next. Then they gave him a piece of broiled fish, and he took it and he ate it in their presence. And then they said to him, and he said to them, This is what I told you while I was still with you. Everything must be fulfilled that is written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms. I love these little details in the gospel account. And you may go, okay, Chuck, why is that important? A physical, little, literal, physical, bodily resurrection. Is that important? Can I just kind of believe in some kind of spiritual, you know, spiritualized resurrection, Jesus? Why, why, why the details? Why, why did he eat a fish? Why, why, why did he say, touch me? Why did he say, here I am? This is real. This is tangible. I'll tell you why he did that. There are a lot of religious systems in this world that believe that the body is somehow evil and that the real good or reality is spiritual. And they may believe in some form of afterlife, some kind of esoteric existence, if you will, some spiritual existence beyond this life. 
that is ill-defined and is not personal and is not tangible. But that is not Christianity. That is not the person of Jesus. You see, Jesus resurrected body, bodily. That means they were able to sense him, they were able to see him, they were able to listen to him, they were able to talk to him, but he was able to do that in a body which was, in fact, a resurrected body. And I don't know about you, but the older I get, the more I realize when I look in the mirror and I live life, this life is temporary and this body will not last. And what does not comfort me is some kind of esoteric spiritual hope that is ill-defined. Instead, it is a combination and a joining together of that which is physical, that which was created by God who created everything that is here and is in the process of redeeming it. And what he is saying is one day all of this will be made whole. And there will be a joining of the physical and the spiritual just as Jesus was God's son and was also fully man. And you and I, through hope in him, have hope of a resurrection that is not some pie in the sky, but is a physical reality to look forward to. And your redeemed body will far surpass your current one, I assure you, okay? And I think that is very important in the day in which we live. I have a friend in Houston, uh, John Wilson. And John used to preach from time to time in small churches in Arkansas. And he told me about preaching in a little church in Arkansas, and they were singing a song he was totally unfamiliar with. It was a hymn that was written by Hank Williams. You may remember Hank Williams. Hank Williams, obviously the country singer, he wrote the song, I Saw the Light, in case you didn't know. But he also wrote a song called, I'll Have a New Life. Okay, I want you to listen to the words for a moment. And it says, on the resurrection morning, when all the dead in Christ shall rise, I'll have a new body, praise the Lord, I'll have a new life. Sown in weakness, raised in power, ready to live in paradise, I'll have a new body, praise the Lord, I'll have a new life. And he said, here's the way it worked in this little country church. He said, when they would sing the refrain, the men would sing a part and they would stop and then the ladies would sing a part. And he said that when they sang the, the refrain, it went like this. When they got to the point where they said, I'll have a new body, I'll have a new life. The men stopped singing and the ladies would sing out, I'll have a new body, I'll have a new life. And he was like, what? Uh, what is this? And he said it was the older women who sang out with the most vigor. I was text, I received two texts, one early this morning, one late last night from friends that are having and going through cancer. And they texted me to say to me, praying for you as you declare the resurrection of Jesus. You see, you and I can have a hope and an assurance of life that although in this life these bodies will wear out and in this life we will experience disappointment and heartbreak, we can look forward to a new day and a time when we will be made whole in him. Johnny Erickson Tata is one of my very favorite people as a writer and an author. She's also a wonderful Christ follower. When she was 17 years old, she had an accident, dove into a, a pool, broke her neck. For 15 years, she's been in a wheelchair as a quadriplegic. On the year that she celebrated her 50th year in a wheelchair, she said she attended a conference where the speaker at the end of the conference, there were hundreds of people in the room, said, I, I want to ask you to get out of your seat and to kneel as we pray before the Lord that day. And here's what she said. She said, I watched everyone else in the room. There had to be five or 600 people and all of them got out of their seats and they knelt in worship of our Lord. She said, I could not help, but the tears flow. She said, I was not crying out of pity. I was not crying because I felt strange or alienated or the only one sitting. 
No, my eyes were wet because it was so beautiful to see everyone else kneeling in prayer. And it made me think of the day when I too will be able to get up out of this wheelchair and kneel before my Savior on, knee, on legs that are whole and with a body who has been redeemed. Do you have that hope today? Do you have the assurance today that cancer does not have the final word? That your past and your sin does not have to separate you from God? That you can experience life and forgiveness and joy and live with hope and the assurance that he has the final word, that the tomb is empty, and that resurrection day will come for you as well. Do you have that hope? Are your eyes open? I pray they are. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you, thank you, thank you. That God, the evidence is there. That Lord, you came in bodily form to show us how to live, to take our place on a cross and to rise on a third day so that we can live with hope. God, I pray this morning, if there be those in this place that have never open their heart to that reality. God, I pray that they would recognize that today your offer of forgiveness and grace is just for them. God, thank you that we can live today forgiven because of Jesus. We can live with hope because of Jesus. And God, we can look forward to a heaven in a real place with a real Savior recognizing those that we love who also love him. God, thank you for life. Thank you for resurrection. May it shape and change the way we live. And I pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for joining us today online. We hope that today's message was an encouragement and blessing to you in your walk with the Lord. We'd love to meet you in person if you're able to join us for worship at 9.30 or 11. Also, if you have questions about the church, feel free to go to our website, friscofirst.church. You'll find plenty of information there. So let us hear from you and look forward to meeting you soon.